Okay, well maybe we'll get started. Uh, so it's a pleasure to introduce Barack Sakai today. Uh, I always tell my undergraduate students that if they're interested in astronomy to just study anything, because astronomy is the study of everything in the universe, so whatever they learn will be useful. And Barack is an excellent example. Uh, so at the ripe old age of 15, he began his undergraduate studies in mathematics at Bar Ilan University. Uh, got his bachelor's in math, then did five years of military service. And then in 2011, he started his master's degree in computer science at the Weizmann Institute. And I think during that time, he got sort of seduced a little bit into astronomy. And in 2013, he started his PhD, also at Weizmann, with Aaron Opek and Abhishek Galyam, two of our wonderful postdoc, former postdocs from Caltech. Um, and he completed his PhD in 2017 on statistical and algorithmic methods in astronomy. Uh, he won the 2017 IAU PhD prize for that thesis. And so Barak has repeatedly used his background in math and computer science to develop sort of really new algorithms for the analysis of astronomical data. And lots of people develop algorithms, but I think what's quite special about Barak's is that they've been practical, powerful, and immediately widely adopted by everybody in the world. Uh, so he's done that many times. Um, so you, you might think that astronomers know how to add and subtract, but it turns out that astronomers did not, in fact, know how to add and subtract images. Uh, <clears throat> but they now use Barak's method. Um, if you're looking for asteroids, you want to be able to find not circles, but streets. And so he's developed an optimal street detection algorithm. If you want to de-disperse fast radio bursts, there are a lot of choices for the de-dispersion with high precision. So he's sped that up. Uh, if you want to search for millisecond pulsars and very tight binary systems, you have to search over all the Keplerian parameters, and that became an exponentially impossible task, but Barak has sped that up. Uh, also, it can be used for period searches in Fermi gamma ray sources where you have 100 photons to try to find a millisecond period in a binary system. That seems almost impossible, but can uh, one can speed that up enormously. Um, he's also thought about telescopes with non-circular pupils, multiplexed imaging telescopes, and today uh, he'll tell us about his work on optimal template banks and search algorithms for gravitational waves as applied to the LIGO data. Thank you, Streb, for this introduction. I also want to thank um, whoever put my name on the list on, of this uh, colloquium speaker. I'm a postdoc still, so I, this didn't uh, go unnoticed. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about detecting gravitational waves on the public LIGO Virgo data. Now, Strel already mentioned much of it, but I want to talk a little bit more about that. So algorithms and statistical methods are my main tools. Those are, in my view at least, indistinguishable than I don't know, new hardware or new techniques to make new hardware because that's a, something that allows you to make new discoveries. Basically, in every modern project in astronomy, that analysis plays a key role. I don't know of a counterexample. In, and it has a bonus that improvement in the analysis methods directly translate to better sensitivity, but it also has the bonus. It's just an algorithm. It's a few formulas and maybe a tiny software. So it also applies to all similar surveys immediately. In, and many times the data is underutilized. Now, having said that, the fact that it applies immediately to all similar surveys directly means that this thing is already packed. So it's hard to make a contribution in that front. In one example that I like to present is the image subtraction example that Strel mentioned. Thank you. Um, the problem, as it was mentioned to me, was that the number of false positives in a supernova survey was just bigger than the number of supernovae. And that's after all cleaner efforts have been made. And this, paper, this problem was a major problem in astronomy. In fact, there were conferences hot wiring the transient universe that tried to deal with this problem. Uh, so the manifestation of this was that human scanning was involved in triggering follow-up telescopes. So supernovae, when you discover them, they are dots of light. If you want to do science from that, you have to apply much more expensive machinery. And human candidates 
scanning was required. No, I always make this mistake. I say human candidate scanning, but what actually I mean is student scanning. <laughs> okay? And we have better things to do with our students than have them scanning for new dots of light in the sky. It's a dot, new dot of light. We have to be able to, to get that. And that actually also does not scale. So if PTF could bear, PTF, the Palomar transient factor is something that Caltech is the major hub of. In, if PTF could manage with one, ZTF could not, because it's, it would require 10 people full time, basically. So that's not the way. Um, now, there's lots of science based on image subtraction, basically all transient science in the optical. So from gravitational wave counterparts, which I'm sure you've heard many times about, to tidal disruption events, which is something that is very cunning because it's by definition coming from a center of a galaxy. So this is an example of something that is an artifact and something that is a tidal disruption event. Now, even your, st your best students couldn't tell the difference. Okay, so it's really a, it was really a big problem. And the reason we know that this thing is not real is that the next day, it's not there, okay? In, in supernova, microlensing nova, all of this depends on that. In, now, what was the real problem with image subtraction? Now, most of the problems in statistics and algorithms usually don't manifest themselves as a problem in statistics and algorithms. Someone comes to you with a problem, he doesn't know that he has a problem in statistics. He doesn't know that. So the real problem, I think, was that there was no actual derivation of the used method. No actual derivation. If you go to the paper, title, optimal image subtraction, no derivation, no justification for the word optimal, for example. Um, and the noise in the reference image was ignored. And the manifestation, the most prominent manifestation, was a complete total loss when the point spread functions of the images do not match. So this is just a simulation. If you have stars, in this image, they would be elongated this way, and stars in this image elongated that way. And if you take the best of the uh, the best state of the art method before me, and you try to do this, you get these horrible things, which are a compromise between a complete ringing in the noise to a miss subtraction of the of the stars or whatever happens. Okay, so what was the solution? The solution was to first realize that it's a problem in the detection statistic and not some ghost. Um, I don't believe in ghosts. Um, and I write a statistical model that encompasses what I think is all the relevant effects. And then I try to solve it from first principles. And voila, false positives are gone. Um, I say voila, false positives are gone, but actually there are like 50 stages in the analysis in image subtraction. 25 before image in the image subtraction and 24 after. So it's really a, a, only lately was really established that the false positives are gone in the ZTF pipeline currently. In, and this allows automatic follow-up on ZTF. So I know that ZTF now can trigger an expensive instrument based on a dot of light found in a single image, uh, previously unnoticed. And just as a bonus, you have 20 to 15% more service speed. This is just an accident. No one knew it's there. This thing has now five or six independent implementations. I can't track of it. And I'm happy that I'm not a software company of any one of them. In more examples that Strel mentioned are image addition. I, I beg to differ, that not all of my things were immediately adopted. In fact, I was extremely frustrated most of my, most of the last, I don't know, five years that things were not immediately adopted. It's immediately on <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that statement. <laughs> In, and Strel also know my secrets because I don't, I'm not very good at keeping secrets. So I already presented the pruning algorithm even though I didn't publish anything about it. I'm a little bit sad about this. Um, one thing Strand did not mention is a recent work about fast parameter estimation for gravitational waves. So actually our first test of the water, if we can swim in the world of gravitational waves, was this work and the thing that was the predecessor of it. 
which is, I don't know, it's kind of an accident. We try to do something about what happens if you have a gravitational wave that is lensed. And while trying to solve what happens with the diffraction effect of the, of the wave, we just noticed that the implementation I had and the implementation that Liang had were 10 to the 4 different in running time. And we asked ourselves, why is that? How can that happen? And then we realized, we realized that I used the trick and this, that this trick is not trivial. I, I didn't know it's not trivial. So we checked what are, what are other people doing and we saw that it applies also to parameter estimation in the general case. And my frustration about this is that we are still the only ones using it. I don't know why. Um, also, this is something I'm dreaming of. If you are interested in high contrast imaging effects of planets, if you can find some spot in my time today or tomorrow, talk to me. Um, I practically talk to, I think, every PhD or postdoc in Caltech, so I think I'm very happy with this visit. Um, now let's go to the main topic of the talk, which is detecting gravitational waves. Um, this is not only my work. This is a work with a, a close collaboration with Teja, Liang, Javier, and Matthias. We basically sit shoulder to shoulder for the past year, and we enjoy every moment of it. Um, this has been facilitated by what I think is the most magical instrument ever done. Now, I'm, I'm using this word magical. Magic means that I actually don't understand how it works. Now, I, I don't like not understanding how things work. I really like to understand every bit of it. And every time I demystify another part of this thing and I say, ah, it's not magic after all, then I uncover much more magic that I wasn't even aware of. So it's still magic to me how this instrument works. I'm sure that in this building you have already heard magnificent talks about the new era of gravitational wave astronomy. So I'm not going to repeat all that. In a short recap of what have we discovered, the astrophysics. In, we have discovered 10 uh, binary black holes that were published by the LIGO collaboration in this gravitational wave transient catalog, number one. In, there was one binary neutron star merger, astounding discovery with a yeah. I'm, I still can't believe that we are the first people who look at such an exciting phenomena. Um, we, and when I say we, I mean me and my collaborators at the IS, um, we basically built an independent pipeline from scratch, from an empty Python file. Um, and Less than a year later, we already published uh, nine binary black hole signals that were found in the uh, open data of the O1 and O2 runs of LIGO. Um, since then, another independent group has recently adopted a few, maybe, you know, the ones that appear at the very, long, the very end of our improvements and detected a few of these three of these nine black holes that we found. Um, and all three is currently up and running, so that's the status. Now, before we talk on how did this magic happen that we found extra signals on the uh, open data that LIGO has generously put out, let's do some intro to how do you, how do you detect uh, merging compact objects in strain data. So the first thing you need to know is the data model. How does the data look like? So basically, the data is constructed from Gaussian noise with a high dynamic range power spectrum. That's the zero-forder approximation of what the LIGO data is. So what do I mean by that? I mean that the noise power is extremely uneven between uh, different frequencies. Okay, so those, this is the frequency band in which it is very sensitive. And these lines are actually design choices. You put all the noise in these lines so that you can have a flat bottom 
sensitive to gravitational waves, but it also makes everything you do on this data be very careful. Because whatever it is that you do, if it's not exact, these lines that are sometimes 10 to the 4 times in power above the noise floor that they stand on, they are going to leak. And when they leak, they are going to destroy every good part of the signal. So you have to be very careful. So this is the data model, and you have to be always aware of this. In the signal model is that, well, GR, it's not very easy to get the prediction from GR. This is something that is still <coughs> mysterious to me, how you can actually get all of these fantastic exact prediction from GR. In basically, the parameters that are relevant in order to express this waveform, this chirp, I'm sure that there have been at least five people in this in audience, in this uh, colloquium series that already did the <laughs> now I'm the six. Yeah, but this thing, this <laughs> is described by some three major parameters and all the rest don't matter that much. So the first one is the total mass, the mass ratio, the second is the mass ratio, the third is the effective spin. So the effective spin is the average uh, Z axis spin of the two components. Um, and to a, second, sec to a secondary extent, to s you can in principle also measure some functions of the in-plane spins or maybe tidal deformability if you're talking about a neutron star merger. Um, but there are also geometric parameters. For example, the sky, sky position, the distance, and the orbital orientation, how this thing is oriented in space. And those matter only when you use two detectors and not one. Okay, so what do you do with a single detector? So this, mod this, this signal model is expressed most conveniently in Fourier space. So I'll also write the signal mod the, the detection statistic in Fourier space. I di we did not invent that. That's something that, I don't know, 100 years old at least. E so basically, you are saying, okay, what is the Gaussian noise in Fourier space? Oh, yes, it's independent variables. And you have a template. And your template says what is the prediction for what should be this particular value. So a matched filter is to take the data and multiply with the complex conjugate of the template. And you inverse variance weight. That's what there is in this formula, nothing too complex. And you can derive it from first principles in less than, I don't know, 15 minutes. OK. So now that we know what to do with one template, let's ask ourselves, how do we detect gravitational waves as a family of things? Because no, no one tells you what should be the parameters of the system that you're going to detect. So you need to construct yourself some template bank. Uh, now, the parameters are continuous. You can't go over an infinite family of parameters and try all of them one by one. That's impossible by definition. So you need to, to have some discretized bank. And in order to decide what to put in the bank and what, what you define, similarity between templates. You say two templates are similar if more than 97% of the SNR is recovered by, it's a binary relation. So if you have one template you are interested in and you use another, you want to, they are similar if, they, if using the other one, the wrong template yields 97% of the SNR. Uh, so a, a good template bank guarantees that every physical waveform is represented. So there is a similar waveform for every physical waveform. And every template you cross-correlate with the data uh, using all detectors. Um, now this is slang in this project, but I'm going to say it by chance many times, so I must just introduce this slang. The LVC also uses this slang, so I'm I'm conforming with it. So time in, times in which the score is high, let's say, I don't know, better signal-to-noise ratio bigger than 4, it's registered as trigger. OK? 
Okay, so if I say trigger, that what, that's what it means. It means that I have a template that I computed this match filter score, and I got a number that is bigger than four. Okay, good. Um, so how do you join multiple detectors? So LIGO had been visionary in building two detectors. This, I think, is one of the most visionary decisions they have ever made. And you can use that for two things. One, to localize the event, and two, to convince yourself you're not imagining that you just saw gravitational waves. So how do you combine uh, multiple detectors? Uh, the allowed time delay on the Earth is about 10 milliseconds. This number you can compute. It's actually a little bit more than 10. And you can do it incoherently, which is by definition not optimal, but it's the simplest to conceive, which is just you have two detection statistics, you add them in quadrature, and coherently, well, you know, these detectors are nearly the same orientation in 3D, which is anyway impossible because the Earth is curved. Um, but they are nearly the same orientation, and therefore the phases and the responses of the LIGO detector should be close. Okay, so there's there's quantitative way to do this optimally, but uh, the easiest thing is to talk about incoherent and just remember that there is another final bullet after you find something that you check its coherency. Okay, so how do you compute false alarm rates? Um, so you have two detectors, and the maximal physical shift is 10 milliseconds, and you can exactly measure the background by just repeating your analysis and not telling the code that you've just moved the detectors 10 seconds apart. An important caveat of this is that there is one way to fool yourself with it, is when you try to judge things that are the first place in... So if you have something extremely loud, time slides are not going to help you understand how loud... How, do, how to convert this loudness to probability. So time slides are usable only when you talk about something that is not saturating the loudness of triggers in the single detector case. Um, now, I think like every, every day in this project, I thank the day that we adopted time slides. Uh, we did not come up with this idea, and I think, I don't know. I don't know how, how I lived before that. So every time you, get, you have some statistical algorithm and you have some result, you think it's significant, it's very hard for you to convince yourself it is significant. It's very hard for you. And this is just an empirical way to get this. You have a background distribution, you know. You know you are correct, and it keeps you honest. It keeps you honest to the bone. So every day I thank myself that I adopt time slots even though at the moment, at the start, like the first half a year of the project, we were grudging our teeth, saying, no, no, we don't need time slides. And then we said, no one's going to believe us if we don't do time slides. And from, since then, we thank ourselves, we do time slides. In the end, you found an event, yay, you detected gravitational waves. Now what? So now you have to do some astrophysics with it. Uh, the first step in doing astrophysics with it is to understand um, what are the parameters of the event. So this is the latest event we published. Um, and what you do is that you define a likelihood function assuming the data is completely Gaussian in the vicinity of the event. You define a prior distribution and you sample from the posterior. It sounds easy. It takes a it takes a while to understand it's easy, but then it's not that easy, but then it, it is easy because you can, we are able to do it within minutes, so. Um, now, a question you must ask yourself. We were asking the, ourselves this question. Why open the project? In July 2018, data is already out for half a year. And 
we didn't know what to do with ourselves. Because on the one hand, there are like 1,000 people in LIGO. Actually, that's an underestimate. It's like 2,000. And it seems that what they are doing is derived from first principles, and it, it looks very good. But then, you know, the best colloquium I've heard in my life was Allen's in Weizmann. And he was presenting what then was called LVT 15, 10, 12 and said that they don't know if it's real or not real. <coughs> and it was barely detected, and it had SNR, network SNR 10. Now, this number 10, 9, 8, 7, they, they mean something. So 10 corresponds to 1 trillion templates. Do you have 1 trillion templates? Trillion independent templates? We could not believe that. So we said, okay, okay, maybe it's just about glitches. And we looked at the strategy for eliminating glitches, and we said 1,000 people in the instrument, they invested like so many complicated things to reduce the noise 10% by 10%, and in the end they have one mechanism to guard from glitches. We could not like comprehend what is going on. And we also knew that glitches could not be the full story because if you have a problem with SNR 10, and this event is actually kind of a, a SNR 7, SNR 7 in the two detectors. So the inferred glitch rate about SN, above SNR 7 is basically one per second, one per few seconds. <coughs> and we just could not believe that. So we found a time in which Matthias was not there to stop us from throwing our time to the trash. And me and Tedja, we downloaded the data. We said, is there a glitch per second? One glitch per second. In <coughs> After we did that, in the first week, we didn't find any glitch. At least not a glitch we could not remove easily. And we said, OK, fine. We are going to do this. And we said, OK, there's only one way to do it. We have to review every choice. So the first. The first improvement is that our template prior is flat in log mass. That's immediately 30% sensitivity. In after a week of work, we found that we could not measure the PSD well enough, and we were lazy developing a code for tracking the PSD. We asked ourselves, what can we do with the wrong PSD? And we found a way to make a measurement of an, the SNR in an exact way using a wrong PSD. And this gave us 30% immediately in binary black holes and binary neutron star. We then said, OK, there are in, infinite glitches in the data. We have to do something about them. So we learned how to remove them. And then we said, wait a minute. Now that we know how to remove even a millisecond of offending data, Maybe we should just look for all offending data and remove it. And we programmed some aggressive masking of bad data. We then said, OK, now that you have something, you did your best at the start, how do you then uh, continue? So we run the thing. We take from the time slides, we take the background, and we take the, the loudest thing, and we ask ourselves, why is that not a gravitational wave? And we found the reason very easily. You look at it by eye, you find the reason. You program something that would remove this. And then a factor of 10 goes down the background. And then you repeat, and you repeat again, and repeat again, and repeat again. And you stop when you don't know, why is this thing not a gravitational wave? In then we realized that, uh, you know, with this with this strong veto, even with that, sometimes we don't know, and you should stop. And you can't just take two numbers, and someone told you you should add them in quadrature. You can't just add them. Let's first plot them. And we immediately saw that there is a better way, and we in invented these rank functions. Um, and the last, last addendum is that we realized that there is some 10 to 20 percent of the universe that actually knows how to appear in one detector and not in the other. And that's just a geometric 
an unfortunate position. But when, when I say that it doesn't appear in the other detector, that's a lie. It appears in the other detector. It's just not a five sigma whopping thing. It's just some three and a half sigma thing that you wouldn't notice or care if you didn't know that there's a part of the universe that has this property. Um, the total both measured and both assessed um, is about 100% more volume. That's not small. Each one of these is not a good reason to open the project, but the add of all of them is. And we indeed doubled the sample. Now, the delta volume of the BNS, I don't know because I don't know what is the LIGO. I don't know how to compare myself to LIGO, so we'll have to live with this question mark. Uh, basically, the most, uh, the hardest to, to evaluate are these things. So when I say bigger than 10%, how can I be sure it's bigger than 10%? It's just LIGO published uh, a list of uh, triggers that are candidate gravitational waves that are sub-threshold. We opened all of them one by one, and they were all vetoed out. Either they were masked immediately and then painted, or the, the veto just took them. So we know it's better than 10%. I don't know if their sum is, be is bigger than 10%, but at least there's some, there some also there. Good, so let's explain something because I must explain something. In, I can't explain all of these things in, in one talk and I'm sure that you will be sleeping, all of you, by the time I finish to explain all these details. So let's choose something that is more easily explainable and explain it. So what's, what do I mean by a more agnostic PIO? So the LVC detection strategy was very agnostic. All candidates from all templates are treated equally. You know, it's a, every template is born the same. Um, but then we didn't like that because if you work out the details of what does it mean, it means that you believe that the rate of neutron star black holes is about 10 to the 3 times the rate of binary black holes bigger than 20 solar mass. And that's not the case. So we could not just go with that. Um, and we said we also don't want to limit the universe. I don't want to say to the universe, you know, spin is zero. Or your prior of spin is e to the minus spin squared. I, I don't know what, is, what does that even mean. And we decided, yes, but you have to put something, right? So we said, OK, fine. Let's, let's distill what we, what we want to achieve with this pi, which is the different phase space. So if you take a binary neutron star merger template, it is responsible for a tiny phase space, like 10 to the minus 3 a fractional a, a region in the mass while a binary black hole template is responsible for 10%. So this phase space argument, this is the thing that we try to capture with this prior. And we decided, OK, so everything is a power law in this, pro in this problem. So if you want to make flat a power law, you just need to divide two logarithmic banks. And also, all the seemingly astrophysical priors also had some power laws in mass. So we were also very happy with that. In. And we said, OK, let's assume that the rate is approximately constant between banks, but who knows? So yes, this could be a factor of 10 off from one side to the other, but at least not 10 to the 3. That, that we solved. In exact SNR determination. So as I told you, the PSD drifts faster, drifts, and it changes. And it actually drifts faster than I can measure it, OK? So I can't actually say what is the PSD that I need to put in my match filter. I don't know. But what I do know is what I want. What I want is something that actually measures SNR. And we worked out what, what happens when you have a wrong PSD. And the manifestation is that you are misestimating the SNR to a linear order in your error of PSD, okay? 
and that creates a tail in the trigger distribution. It's very easy to understand if you have a 12% misestimation of this PSD and it happens only 1% of the time, then uh, the, a better economical way to create an 8 sigma trigger is to go to this 1% of the time in which you misestimated the standard deviation, make a 7 sigma fluctuation. This would dominate the background distribution at 8 sigma. So when you go so far in the distribution, this determination of, sta of standard deviation needs to be exact to few percent, otherwise you're going to see a big tail. In now it turns out that if you also work out the formulas, it turns out that you can also promise that you are 1%, 1% from optimal. Even though your PSD is wrong to 10%, your likelihood is correct to 1%. And this is the key observation that allowed us to say, okay, that's a permissible strategy, that's what we do, and let's move on, because this 1%, I don't know how to improve it, but I'm not sure it's worth the time. Um, now, this is a figure from our pipeline. So what is this figure? This is the SNR squared. It's donated raw uh, as the convention in the field. And this is the com cumulative trigger distribution. So you take a cumulative distribution from the right to the to the left, okay? So if I do nothing with my pipeline, I have this blue distribution. If I veto the things that are obviously not gravitational waves, it's something very loud that somehow slipped through all my nets, I'll have this black distribution, okay? And you see this nine sigma, nine, I, I don't have enough templates to have a nine sigma fluctuation. That's, it's not Gaussian noise in the traditional case, but then, I apply this correction. I measure the standard deviation locally to the event to 1% precision, and I correct the SNR. And boom, what we have is this distribution. And I can compute using the number of templates in the bank, using scipy.stats.chi-squared, what should be this number with 100 days of data of Livingstone. And I can get this number to a factor of two and the thing that I don't get to a factor of two is actually just, it's very hard to understand how many actually independent templates you have because they are all correlated. So I was extremely happy by that. Maybe this factor of two is glitches, but I think it's just because I don't know how to estimate how many independent templates I have. Um, yes, so. Now, what is the effect of this on heavy black holes? Maybe it's not relevant to heavy black holes. Um, so, indeed, if you just do this correction, this PSD drift correction, you don't see much, okay? But then you have to remember, wait a second, there are more than one way to make this. So, yes, you have glitches. After the veto, after I'm applying my signal consistency checks, I get this black thing. And yes, after you removed one reason for having a glitch, you know, enter the barrier in which this SNR determination is still important. Still, this 30% is still there. Okay. Last thing I'm going to try to explain, and even that not with formulas, is in painting. So I'm sure all of you saw already this uh, magnificent that happened in, uh, seven, in August 17, 2017. And it had a glitch. It had a glitch. It doesn't, it's not a, it's an objective thing. It has a glitch. And it's not something bad to say about the signal. It just happens that at this time, at the Livingstone detector, there was a glitch. Now, it's easy to, to see this thing hits you so hard in the nose, you bleed. Okay, if, if, if I run my pipeline on this without correcting this glitch, it would return like infinite amounts and write to, the mem write to disk until I have no, no place left in my account. So, <laughs> so I have to do something, I have to remove this. If I remove this the LVC recommended way, okay, then I get this thing. This wasn't here, you see? wasn't here. So what is this? 
Any ideas? So remember, there are lines. These lines are four orders of magnitude above the background. And they are coherent. They are coherent for tens and tens and tens of seconds. And you just removed one second of data. It's going to leak out. Of course it's going to leak out through the transfer function. And it's going to leak out and ring all over. Okay, so you just destroy this frequency band. Okay? And even that is after you do your best with windowing and filtering. And all. You do your best, it's still there. Um, now comes the question, what do you do? So we said, okay, we can't just do something approximate. And Matthias remembered, wait a minute. In CMB, there's this thing called in-painting, and we worked it out again. And it turns out that it's just, there's a linear algebra way. You just say, okay, fine, I don't like this five millisecond of offending data, or maybe 30 millisecond, I don't remember. I don't like them. So I want to just imagine that there's infinite noise there. I can add it myself, or I can just imagine that there's an infinite noise there. Um, and then I can write a covariance matrix. The covariance matrix has something about the noise in Fourier space that has all these lines, so this covariance matrix is going to have lots and lots and lots and lots of data inside it. And I add a term to the covariance matrix that I have infinite noise in these samples. Okay? And it turns out that if you work out the linear algebra problem, that there's an effective data term that emerges. So what does it mean? It means that regardless of the template, there's one correction you can apply to the data and then just assume it was just as before. Okay? So, so this is just replacing the bad data using a linear predictor from the surrounding sample. So you need to figure out what is the linear predictor from the surrounding samples. You replace it. Shalom al Israel. And, and it has the uh, property that if there was a delta function gravitational wave in the, at this particular time, you are completely insensitive to it, as should be, because you have infinite Gaussian noise at this time. So you should be not sensitive. And that actually is the, con is the real condition that defines how to find the solution. That's a very good question. So uh, I have a slide on that. If I, if I finish my talk at, in time, which I won't, is this clock OK? What is the time now? So maybe we'll do it later. In discoveries. So, a quick recap on science questions concerning binary black holes. So, oh man, this is too slow, too small. So, how do they form? Is it dynamic formation? Is it binary stellar evolution? Each one of these things has predictions like isotropic spin or aligned spin. Or should I see eccentricity ever or not? In, should, I, should I see maximal spin ever? or not? Is there an upper mass gap? Is there a lower mass gap? Um, what about prompt coalescence? Is this thing uh, tracking star formation? Should, uh, if I see the host, should it be a star forming galaxy or could it be red and dead? All these things are open questions. No one in astrophysics can really predict what it is. I think there are more models than events detected. So discoveries. Number one, the most significant thing we found actually has negative spin. Okay, so if you look at this, it has a negative spin, almost reject zero. His choice, not mine. Um, but it seems to me that perhaps this thing is knowing to do negative spin. Our least significant event, this thing has a, basically a coin flop. Is it real or not? Again, not my choice. Again, thank you for time slides. If I didn't if I wouldn't do time slides, I wouldn't be able to stand behind such a thing. Um, so yes, this is a coin flip. Is it real or not? And if it is real, it is negative spin completely. Um, another discovery, high spin. So this event, so this has a little bit more curves than the regular thing because you have to put a prior. 
what does it mean that you put a prior? So if your prior says isotropic spin, you feel very good about yourself because your prior is isotropic. But then you remember that isotropic spin means effective spin, chi effective. It has a zero prior to be one. So you can't ever, ever say on something that has spin one because you will always push it to the left every time. You would never let reality confuse you. Uh, so we said, what is this? Let's replace the prior with something that at least lets me detect something that is spin one. I don't know if I can stand behind the prior, but at least I can understand what my data is trying to drive me into. And this is what it tries to drive me into. It tries to drive the spin to be maximal, which I think is a remarkable thing. I, it, it seems to me that you can't do it with a globular cluster or dynamic formation mechanism. So if you think all black holes are dynamic formation mechanism, I remind you that there is some 20% or something like this, 30%, that this thing is a glitch, so you have an exit uh, for now until all three come. In discovery number three, high mass. Uh, so the latest discovery we made has a, such a high total mass that I'm actually showing the individual masses here. And the higher mass is inferred to be 56, which is very inconvenient if you, are, if you remember per instability supernova predictions. It's kind of inconvenient. Uh, but you still have an exit, maybe, you know, there's a 15% this thing is not real, and there's also the, the fact, but, you know, each of these things is another clue to the list, because they could not all be not real, okay? And let's put something that summarizes all the discoveries in one place. So this is the total mass, M1 plus M2, versus spin, and each of these ellipses is an error bar that I think encompasses some 60% of the points. So all these measurements are very noisy in some sense. But I, I don't know if you see it, but do you see it? I, you, I look at this, you know, it's very colorful, but there's also like lots of white space and I don't understand how could this thing, if this thing is really dynamic formation, how could it have so much white, white space? And how does it know to do this? So. This, each one of these things has a very big error bar, but this error bar is aligned with where they are. <laughs> so it seems to me, you know, it could be that all of the events are just originated, originating from here, but how do they know not to do this? How do they know not to do this? It's a, it's a puzzle for me. In, so those are the discoveries. Now, in our latest paper, we put something that we call GW candidate. 17042. So if, the, if on something like that is coin flip, correct or not correct, I, I could put the GW name because of some convention. Why do I put this GW candidate? The reason is that I actually, I did a mistake. I look at the solution and I know that there is a better solution than the solution we found. I just don't know if it plays ball with GR. So what happened? So you do regular parameter estimation, you get something like this with an uncom uncomfortable spin of 0.9, that is, that's it. If this thing is a real signal, uh, dynamic formation is out the window. But then we said, okay, LIGO is gonna tell us, you know, you didn't use this spin, you, this prior, that prior. We did it with the LIGO prior, just in case just in order to show in the paper, you know, that you can't drive this thing to zero speed. And then we found another solution, completely different solution. So this is what happens when you use the LIGO pile, and this is what happens when you use our pile, and we were scratching our heads. How could it be that you have two solutions to the same thing, and they differ by mass by a factor of two, and spin goes from one to zero? And we were very curious. So we go back to our template bank. We remember that we ordered it in a very special way that allows us to understand the correlations inside. So this is this geometric placing. Um, and these parameters don't correspond to any physical parameters, so I'll just call them C2 and C3. It doesn't matter. All you need to, map to know is that each of these things is, is a template. The entire template bank is in this plane, and the correlation function in this plane is just a circular Gaussian. 
okay, at locally circular Gaussian, and when you go far away, it, be it begins to ring a little bit like the dirty images in radio astronomy. So we said, okay, fine, let's have a heat map on all of these templates and see if there are two solutions. I should see two spots, and voila, I see two spots. We were scratching our heads. Is that real? Could that be Gaussian noise? And then the answer is no, one in 10,000. So it has to be either a real phenomenon or a very curious glitch. Now, can I produce, can, can I reproduce such a phenomenon before I solve for the solution? Can I reproduce it? And the answer is yes, I can reproduce it. So if I look at these solutions, I see the factor of two in mass and I ask myself, okay, so what happens if you have a higher harmonic, let's say the 3-3 free free emission harmonic, and you try to solve it with the 2-2 two two harmonic? What would be the inferred mass? And the answer is that it's going to be a factor of two smaller. And, and once we saw that, we said, okay, let's just pick some waveform model. Let's just pick some parameters such that there would be a 3-3 free free mode. And can we see these two solutions? And the answer is yes. And we were very happy. We said, oh, we must be able to solve it. And we detect higher harmonics. Everything would be fine. And we include higher modes. And we measure the parameters. And voila, shalom al-Israel. Only one solution. And this solution is the high spin, high mass solution. And we were almost happy about it until we asked, what is the SNR squared recovered by this? And we saw some number. And then I took these two solutions, and I said, okay, these are two signals in a linear space. I can compose the optimal combination between them and make some SNR that is bigger than each one of them because they are, in, they are not perpendicular, but they are also not very correlated. And I could compose the solution with higher SNR, SNR squared 90. And we were again scratching our heads. Is that good enough to make this a thing or not, and we are still in debate about that. If you have any opinion, you can tell us. The jury is still out. And perhaps it's good enough, perhaps it's not. But it seems to us also, because we, we then looked at the black boxes we are using, this uh, IMR phenom higher modes, it turns out that this thing is not, not doing all, not going all the way from not having higher modes to having higher modes exact to GR. So there is hope that when you do this with actual GR that is valid uh, to a Q of uh, 1 over 4, let's say, you find the correct solution. There is a, there is a hope. Uh, we are still trying. Uh, it turns out that it is, at these regimes, the waveform models don't exist, and I, I hope LIGO would release, some, would release or do this themselves. I'm happy if they do it themselves. Uh, would release a waveform model that covers this particular region of a uh, high mass ratio uh, and a uh, high spin with potential processing spin. Um, I don't have time for that. If you want to identify host galaxies of binary black holes, ask me about my idea. And I'll end with that so you can read while asking me questions. What are my future plans? Thank you. So it wasn't driven by GR, so I can't actually tell you what is the physical parameters of this. I just took two signals that I saw. They have some inner product with the data. And I did the math, what should be the optimal combination of them. So it's like in a plane. It's like in a plane. I have this vector, and I have this vector. They are not perpendicular, but they are also not the same. And I know that the projection on this vector is like that, and the projection on this vector is like that. And I ask, what is the longest vector in this plane? So it's something over here, right? So it's something over here. And this is longer than I, this distance from 0 is longer either than this or that. 
So this was longer also from the solution that I could recover with GR. Is that, did that answer your question? Well, I don't add infinite amount of Gaussian noise. I just assume it is there and solve as if it is there. And the solution is to take a piece of data and complete what should be in this piece of data from everywhere in the, in the signal. So it's really in painting. So you really look at all the lines you have in the PSD and you complete them coherently over this piece of data. And that, this way, they do not interfere with your business later. Coherent in, I, I don't know what that means. It's, so the thing is, time, the phenomena is time domain. You have something bad happening in time domain. You have to replace some samples with something else. And I guess the point is that the lines are narrow because they last for a long time. And so yes. in time domain, mm -hmm. you have to put in the sine waves from all the ringing of mm -hmm. delta functions to keep running them out of it. Yes. So it would allow you to be lazy and not in paint, but in painting is not, you know, you, you write it, it takes like, I don't know, three days. Probably it would take a factor of 100 more to you to get a student to remove all the lines. And once you do this in painting, this in painting is not to get rid of the lines. It, this in painting is just in order to be able to delete samples without having the, the lines leak out. But this in-painting problem is a software that is not very complicated. It's a linear algebra problem that your computer, your laptop would solve. And I don't see a reason to, to fix it in hardware. I can also notch them in software if I really, really wanted. It's not there. Treating the variable PSD, you said you could treat it as one parameter. Is that just assuming that the shape is fixed and the amplitude so, is going up and down? Or? So if, if the shape is fixed and the amplitude is going up and down, I can tell you that my solution would be optimal. Mm -hmm. So yes, you can view it that way. The, the real key point about that is that <coughs> the shape don't matter to you to first order except for the effect of wrong standard deviation. Except for that effect, the shape doesn't matter. To second order, it does matter, the shape. So you better do a good job to get the shape correct to 10%. And then after you got the shape correct to 10%, you can just live with 1% loss of sensitivity due to mistracking the PSD. And it turns out that the typical fluctuations are of the order of 10%. I, I don't have a theorem that this would last forever, but... Uh, it seems to me that when this is the status of things, you can stop and say, fine, this is my losses. I guess is it obvious, though? I mean, I could have imagined if you had very large variable low frequency noise and high frequency was fixed, in which case the shape would be changing dramatically with the amplitude. Yes, but so remember, it's correct to first order. So what you're saying is that the second order could come and bite you if you have something like a factor of two more noise in some frequency band of 10 hertz in some place. Yes, it can happen. Usually we call that a glitch and we in-paint over that. Uh, but yes, it, sure. Uh, if, you, if you do a bad job and you use a PSD that is e not good to 50%, then you are going to lose substantially in the SNR. So you need to, so the premise of this solution is that, you know, if previously you had to get into 1%, I just said, no, okay, fine, 1% is, is very hard. You don't have to get there. Get to 10%. I, I made the circle much bigger. Now you can aim with your eyes closed and maybe you'll get it. Is that a fair answer?
Yes. So, so mm -hmm. Yes. Well, when you interpolate with a linear function, it's just assuming the PSD is something, and this something would be some red noise that you just did a curve like this, and it would be fine. But whenever you have these strong lines, this solution just doesn't go. Because you have something that does this, and you marked all of that wrong, and you can't just take this sine wave that ends here and connect it with a line there. That's not the solution. So with lines, it just doesn't go. But for example, if you analyze Kepler data or any radio telescope data or any of these things, they, of course, they have red noise like every instrument in the, on the globe. And y yes, astronomers already in paint by interpolation. And this just, if you do that without a formula, then yes, it would work when the data is forgiving. But when you have these strong lines, it just doesn't work, it doesn't apply. You have to. It's a fancy interpolation, yes. Yes. So we, we also had this confusion. Uh, the confusion is that you don't actually know the PSD, so how can you interpolate the data based on some bad PSD? And then we looked at the formulas, and then we said, wait a minute. What matters is that I, in paint, according to the PSD, I believe in, and then all my corrections are okay, my SNR is okay, and the uh, the precision with which I measure the optimal detection SNR is still 1%. That's what was the, that was what guided us, and if you can get this mark by applying some magic, sure, but linear algebra did that. So we just wrote a covariance matrix. Did I answer your question? I, I'm not sure. Yes? Okay, well, let's thank Barack and...